Hey guys, I am Thomas Kim, um, Nifty alum, um, and I'm talking with Emily Ann Hoffman about uh, Treasure, which is my film, and Nevada, um, her film. Um, both are stop motion animated shorts, and yeah, I'm gonna have Emily introduce herself too. I'm Emily, Thomas said it all. I'm here with Nevada, he's here with Treasure. Maybe we should just start with like, what was the impetus for that film and like, where were you at that stage in your life? and what made you want to make it? Um, yeah, that film, I think it was three and a half years ago now. Man, it's time has really flown by. Um, middle school, um, you know, I was taking photography. Um, I found a Canon DSLR, the T3i, in my parents' closet. And I started taking pictures and, you know, I became like the, the artsy Instagram kid in middle school with like the cool photos. Um, so my guidance counselor was like, Thomas, you should just take this filmmaking class. There are a few spots open. Um, and so I was like, you know, can't take photography, might as well take this thing called filmmaking. I have no idea what it is. I, I didn't associate filmmaking with movie making. Like I didn't, I thought it was just like films or something like that, um, like traditional photography film. And then second semester of freshman year of high school, um, we were supposed to do another documentary, but I asked the teacher if I can just do something on my own and, and kind of submit it. And I wanted to do like a docu-fiction kind of thing. Um, so I, I shot that and I had a little clip of stop motion in the middle of that short film. Um, and that kind of like sparked my interest to go into stop motion and learn more about this craft. I think especially because I wanted to go into live action, but I didn't have the connections or the resources to make a live action film. Um, you know, I had no money, I had no one who else who wanted to make films. Can I interrupt real quick and ask just so that little stop motion segment in the short film that you made, how did you even know, because I, at that age, I didn't know anything about animation, how it worked. And so how did you even know or decide to experiment with that medium? <laughs> I, I can't tell you, I don't know what drove me to do that. Um, I basically, it was very simple. It was like, you know, using clay and then um, printing out like backdrops and then just like animating in front of that um, instead of building sets or anything like that. Second semester of freshman year, um, I wanted to make this film, Treasure. Um, I was inspired by like a news article that I read in Korea. And then the project grew bigger, like the storyboards and like the story got bigger. Um, I did a Kickstarter. I just set the goal for the Kickstarter for $4,000 and we raised around like $6,000 in total. Yeah, that kind of um, helped pay for like the 3D printer that I used to, you know, print all the little toys that are in the film, buy all the supplies. Um, and I didn't really know much about stop motion at that point, but it was a lot of just online research, calling people who worked at Leica, um, the, the stop motion company behind Coraline and those films. How did you um, have the time to do this um, amidst high school? <laughs> I didn't really socialize that much, to be honest. And that's something I kind of regret um, now, but um, it was like, you know, going home from school, working on this and then repeating kind of. Um, wow. I did do sports a little bit. I was kind of a lax bro, you know, that was my, this project was my main thing. Um, and yeah, that was, that's how I, uh, this, this project got started and got made. I want to talk, talk more about your film. No, I just want to say I'm a huge fan of your work. I think I've seen everything except Blackheads because maybe it's online, but I haven't seen that um, yet, but I've seen all your other films and. Yeah, I was in a very different stage in my life when I made Nevada, perhaps indicative from my questions. I did not touch animation in high school at all. Um, I always knew I wanted to be an artist and then went to art school and studied at um, Rhode Island School of Design and was in the illustration department. Thought I was going to be more of like a painter, illustrator. And then my junior year, took an animation class and just realized I had this kind of like cliche, like, oh, storytelling, time-based medium, this is great. And I love stop motion because I love working with my hands. It's very tactile and like I got to paint and draw and sculpt and all these other things that I knew I wanted to do. Um, so yeah, made a short film with a friend of mine my senior year that was stop motion. And um, we had a lot of fun and we were trying to figure out, we were like, oh, people submit to film festivals. I guess we'll submit to film festivals, but I had no idea what we were doing and just like, wasted a ton of money on entry fees and didn't really get into many, but then got into a couple that were legit. And through that experience of meeting other filmmakers, I started to realize like, oh, independent filmmaking, that's what I'm interested in. 
other people who have done things like what I've done or calling themselves directors. I guess I'm a director as well as an animator and an artist. After that whole experience, I was like, okay, now I want to make another film with more intention. Essentially, I had an experience similar to the storyline in Nevada, and I wrote a short story about it because I liked the story. And then was like, all right, I'm going to try to adapt this into a script. Like bought some screenplay books and um, my sister's boyfriend, now fiance at the time, um, was kind of into production. And I remember sending him the first draft of the script and he was like, this is great, but like you wrote this in a Word document and this format is insane. Like there's programs that you can write mm. scripts in. So then figured out what final draft was and kind of started doing some preliminary planning, um, but knew that I wanted to ideally not just make it in my basement um, and get a little bit less scrappy than the last film. So applied to some fellowships and ended up getting into um, the creative culture program at the Jacob Burns Film Center, which was really pivotal for me in my career. And, and they were just like an amazing support system. And I actually got a space, like a real shooting space to work in and, and people to help me with lighting and, and camera work and, and made it from there. But I, I think people ask me often why I made that film in, in animation and stop motion or just like any of my films, but I don't know if you feel this way, but I'm like, you wouldn't ask that of a live action filmmaker. Like, that's just what they do. Like, I am an artist. I like tactile things. This is the medium I really like. So that was a huge reason why I did it animated because that's what I knew. But also that story is very intimate, very vulnerable, a little risque. And I think that having this almost like wall of having these characters not be real people allows audience members to detach a little bit. Completely agree with you. I think that even in live action, when the, the story or the way it's filmed is too close to reality i think like the way real life is i think um people can often feel uh disconnected from that even more you know it's like the reason why stories exist is because you're feeding medicine inside you know a tasty like cupcake or something like that you know it's it's all wrapped up in something that's not real but that makes it easier to swallow like you know swallow a pill Spoonful of sugar makes the right, yeah down. yeah that's the that's the what I was thinking. <laughs> um, totally, yeah. I think there's like an implicit humor and cuteness to doing stop motion. It's like oh, you it's this miniature world. Like look at these wonky people. That's um, that's kind of cute, and it, it allows you to almost like relax into the story a little bit more. And in yeah, your case, absolutely. you're like surprise an emotional <laughs> story and difficult journey of courting and grandmother granddaughter yeah. relationship <laughs> you know obviously you don't want the image the film to feel too disconnected from the audience and i think the way you brought that emotional connection was through the the, the overlay dialogue thank you yeah i think that's something that i get frustrated with in terms of mainstream animation is that it a lot of it kind of feels like one genre and one style of voice acting um, that's very like cartoonish and that always confused me. I was like, just because we're doing animation doesn't mean that actors have to be like talking like this, <laughs> you know, like can't they just act normally? I think yeah. along that, something that we both did in different ways is like you use that really interesting compositing eye technique and my characters had like a, you know, it was hand-drawn faces, but I had rotoscoped my actors' faces. And I know for me, that was a technique, again, to like humanize these otherwise wonky looking characters a little bit more and, and give them more human expressions. Yeah, I think, um, I mean, you, you you nailed it. It was just to add a bit of humanity to these lifeless puppets that feel, that can feel very robotic and plasticky at the times. But for, yeah, for Treasure, um, cast two actresses brought you know put some tracking markers on their faces and then over a green screen i just played back the shot and then had them recreate the movement with their head in 3d space but 
didn't line up, obviously, because it's not going to line up frame by frame. And also, these tracking markers were useless because, I mean, nowadays we have Snapchat and it's like doing AR face tracking. I'm like, oh my god, where's this oh, technology crazy. coming from? Like, if I can just yeah. like take this technology and just like plop it into my After Effects software, it would be like life changing. And so, what I had to do was basically,、um, I could manipulate the X and Y axis on the image. So if I, if the, the if we if I record the the actress turning her head 90 degrees, and the camera's here, then I can manipulate the X and Y axis. With just you know, just moving the image around、um, to fit on top of the puppets,、um, but the Z axis wouldn't fit, right? So I could manipulate, move this image around, but the timing and the Z axis wouldn't fit. So basically, what I'm trying to say is, I had to go in frame by frame and find the right frame from the live action eyes and. Paste it and blend it into the puppet's eyes. It was basically doing stop motion through a computer because it was like a frame by frame process. So for people watching who aren't animators, like it's crazy because animation is a frame by frame process. Which I don't know what frame rate you're at. I usually work at twelve frames per second, but that's kind of like the lowest you can go with it looking smooth. So、yeah. for every second of film you see, that's twelve pictures. And then what Thomas is describing is that after he did all of that. And he had to go back in, and every single one of those thousands and thousands of frames, then again animate on top of that. So you you animated your film at least twice <laughs> in terms <laughs> of like frame by frame work that you had to do. Yeah, is... right. And then it was all the rig removals because I was like so lazy in the production process. I had like rigs everywhere、uh, that will like、uh, hold up the puppets and all the little props that's flying around.、Um, so it's a ton of rig removals, like. I think my production process was one year for prep and like all the mold building, everything. One year for production, and then one year for、uh, all the post stuff.、Um, but I'm curious about、uh, you also did frame by frame for the 2D animation on on the on the faces, right? Yeah, yeah. We devised this kind of like DIY process. Also, I'll say in terms of my background, like I said, I really like. Stop motion because it's a tactile. I was scared of computers for a really long time. Like any post work, I did not touch After Effects for a long time. But so when we recorded our voice actors, we devised this like DIY mocap rig where we had them sit in a chair and we put a life vest on them that strapped them to the chair so they couldn't move around too much, and then a helmet attached to C stands. So that they couldn't move their head too much, and then we had a camera straight on three quarter angle and a profile angle. So we recorded their faces as well as their voices, and then animated the whole film. Yeah, then in Photoshop, I did 2D rotoscoping, which is rotoscoping is tracing over live action footage to to source、um, like animation footage.、Um, so yeah, trace that frame by frame. And then put it on top of the puppets.、I、learned a lot, and I learned who my my real friends are because I asked a lot of family members <laughs> and friends to help me、um, color in all the frames of rotoscope. My parents ended up helping me a little bit, which was very very sweet. But I think also like they understood in theory how laborious animation was. But my dad, the whole time he was doing it, he was like. What's wrong? There must be a better way. There must be a better way. It's like, what's wrong with you? Why did you choose this? My parents were the exact same way. <laughs> They're like, <laughs> yeah, my dad's like a very tech savvy guy, so he's like, there's got to be a better way to do this. Like, I'm gonna like build a program so you can, you know, do the VFX. Yeah, but they even like they were so supportive.、Um, I don't know about you, but、um, they we actually moved to a different house to shoot this film because. Uh, I was living in an apartment and it didn't have a garage, and I needed like a concrete surface to、uh, animate on because I can't do it on carpet, right? Then it'll like move around.、Um, so we moved to a different townhouse in the back of the apartment complex that have that has like garages. Like we like moved. Your parents moved for your production. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So、Those、we moved. I got. Supportive parents. I know. Yeah, I feel very blessed.、Um, so we moved. Got a garage. And you know, had concrete floors to animate on,、um, and, and all, like the Massachusetts winters were terrible. Oh my gosh, I, I just remember it was like, you know, it's like, and you can't 
and I couldn't turn on the heaters in the garage or like any sort of heaters because then the electricity would, would fluctuate and then the lights would start flickering. Um, usually on a bigger film set, you would have like a UPC, which is like a big battery that'll power all your, all your lights so that the voltage doesn't um, fluctuate and then your frames don't flicker. We didn't have a UPC. So um, I just told my parents like, don't run the laundry, don't do anything. <laughs> For months uh, at a time? Well, no, like during the day, like while, while okay, I'm okay, animating. Okay. Yeah. And during the night, shoot, got can... it. Yeah. Wow. Um, do you have siblings? I have one little brother, he's 11. Wow. Yeah. And you didn't get it. I feel like if I tried to take over my house like that, I have three sisters and they'd be like, Ally, get out of the basement, stop being weird. <laughs> No, the <laughs> I had a question about your voice actors really quick. Um, just like, did you direct them? How did that work? Were they just really good at acting? Yeah, they were great actors. I did direct them, but um, it was a very easy, great experience because they're they were both really talented. Um, and they were both just awesome. I mean, I think, like I said, they were strapped in life vests and in a helmet and couldn't move their head or their body and still I think gave pretty naturalistic performances and on top of that um they weren't able to record on the same day so they didn't even act off of each other so wow. we had someone else reading the other lines to them well, let's talk about live action before we have to wrap up um well you've done like you've incorporated live action in all your stuff um, but do you have like plans to go move into more live action stuff or do you want to stick with animation and what's your approach to that? Yeah, so Bug Web is actually the second one. Um, I had another film that was at Mifty actually the year before, Nevada, called OK Call Me Back. That Bug Bite though to me felt like my first like quote unquote real live action piece because OK Call Me Back, I am in it and then my friend just shot it for me. So it was a very small set like it was just the two of us honestly part of bug bite was just and wanting to do something live action was that i was mainly interacting with live action filmmakers um and i was also exhausted after doing nevada um mainly on my own i had a lot of help but also did most of it on my own and so i was like yeah. live action seems easier i just i want to try that and i also was like i want to prove to myself that i can do this which I really enjoyed the process. I'm really glad I did it, but I also learned that it's not necessarily easier than animation. There's just different challenges. You know, it's like a pick your poison thing. I think I just real didn't realize why I loved animation is because I'm a control freak and I like to control literally everything um, because that's what animation is. Is like you build yeah. this entire world and then you literally like from head to the toes are controlling a character's movement. Live action, I was like, oh, this is a, really a lot about trust and collaboration. You can improve a film by making it a team sport because everyone brings different skills to the table and um, has different things. But at the same time, it felt a little bit like a homecoming of like, mm. oh, okay, it's just me and my dolls again. Like, <laughs> I can do this. Right. But what about you? You made this beautiful, I don't know if it's publicly available, but beautiful proof of concept, short live action film C, right? Yeah. What was that journey like for you? Yeah, I think it was, a, it was very similar to yours. Um, the thing about stop motion that I love is not only is it very tactile, but it, you can control literally every single step of that process. I don't know what it's like working with multiple people, multiple people on a stop motion project. So I've never done that before. And then I think doing go, transitioning completely into live action was, yeah, like you said, it was just a huge jump from doing everything yourself and like literally every frame is you, right? It's like it's completely you. And then just going from that to just uh, you're completely taking a backseat. You're just communicating to the people who will make that film. Um, that was a very that's a very drastic change. I, I was a control freak, but I've been learning to like kind of let that go and just kind of like not care so much and find the 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 fun and the the indie spirit in like going out with you know a group of friends that you you know really trust um, and making a movie, um, kind of just like finding the the scene on the day, like as scary as that is. 
finding the inspiration from the location and the actors on the day of the shoot and then doing that every step of the way from from pre-production to post you're kind of given all the materials for the the stop motion uh the world like you're given the set you're given the puppets and then other people are animating it you're not touching anything so it's like it's kind of scary it's really scary and like there's so many ways it can go wrong um because you're not in control um but i think there's there is something very beautiful about when it works, um, you find something that you would have never been able to get to by yourself. And it makes me think, I'm trying to remember who said it. I think it might've been Barry Jenkins in a podcast, but someone, a director was talking about what the actual work of directing is and like all the really hard work is actually all in prep. And then you show up to set and like, you just hope that you've done all the prep necessary, but and all the research and, and all that foundational work. But then once you're actually on set, it's like you said, you kind of throw the notes out and you're just like, all right, we're here. We're just gonna go with the flow and do what we gotta do. Yeah, yeah. I think it's such a different way of thinking about films than stop motion. And that was, I'm still learning how to like, you know, forget my stop motion habits and my way of thinking and like kind of transition into live action and like the improvisational nature of live action. Um, a question what's the best piece of advice you've received received related to filmmaking? I feel like the two things that I think of that have been said to me and that I've said to people before is one, I'm pretty sure Issa Rae said this first thing in regard to like networking or building your network. Um, more importantly than networking laterally and like trying to meet people who are way above you on the quote unquote ladder is just forming really great connections with people, with your peers, like whether you're in school or programs or stuff like that. Um, because while you're all starting at the same level, you're all gonna continue to grow. And, and that's the, if you're truly friends with these people, admire their work, trust them as collaborators, then you'll just kind of bring, like if one person succeeds, then they bring everybody else up, you know? And I feel like that's been proven to be true with people I've met in school or through um, the Jacob Burns program. It's like, we all just are constantly hiring each other or collaborating with each other. And it's become a really beautiful friendship and collaborative experience and, and almost more fruitful than anyone that we've like reached up towards and mm. uh, tried to grab onto their coattails. Good, good what, what's your advice? I'd say something that Barry Jenkins said when he was writing Moonlight was you know, he, he went to film school, Florida State, and you know, when you go to film school, they teach you how to write and they tell you, write what you can see and write what you can hear. Um, Barry said, you know, he subscribes to the idea of like writing what you can feel. Um, and, I, and I really kind of took that to heart with all of my projects, trying to get, get out of feeling. Yeah, emotionally based. Um, every scene has a feeling, something that you can't describe, but through picture and sound, you can feel. Um, I think Barry does that really great. I know, you know, other film, I, Nevada, of course, all of your films, just like, it's, it's, it has such an evocative feeling at the end, right? When it cuts to credits, you're like, you have the chills, you know, it's just such a visceral feeling. And I don't know what that feeling is. I can't describe it, but it's there and it's very unique. Um, I think that's what films are for, at least the films that I want to make.